Our discussion today is on improving diversity and inclusion in the rotorcraft industry. Uh, not only is that a great thing to do um, to improve business practices, but we also know that there is uh, an upcoming employment shortage in the rotorcraft field. And I know that Jim will uh, discuss that in just a moment. Uh, first thing I'd like to do is uh, introduce our speakers today. We have Jim Viola, President and CEO of HAI. We have Brian Gambino, who is the President of the National Gay Pilots Association. We have Vanessa Blacknall Jameson, who is the Chairwoman for the Board of Directors for the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. And we have Allison McKay, the Chief Executive Officer for Women in Aviation. This is a, uh, a participant encouraged event. We do ask that you uh, ask any questions you might have. To ask your questions, there is a question module in the control panel on the side of your screen. Simply open that, type up your uh, question and submit it and we will hopefully get to your questions towards the end of the webinar. We'll begin with the presentations. If you miss something, um, if you want to review something, if you want to share this with somebody else, we will have video links available for this tomorrow. Um, it usually takes about 24 hours for us to get it posted to the rotor.org website. Um, I think that uh, the link is actually emailed out to everybody as well. Uh, we will get that out as quickly as we can. It just takes a little while for the video to render. Now I'd like to introduce Jim Viola, the president and CEO of HAI. Thanks, Dan. Uh, glad everybody could join us today. And, and of course, as uh, we talked about uh, for the signups, how jobs in our industry can be made more appealing to get a greater range of applicants is one of our uh, focuses for today, as well as the issue you may encounter in broadening your organization's diversity and inclusiveness, and how to overcome those obstacles to incorporate uh, diversity and inclusiveness in your workplace, and then also the benefits your businesses will gain by implementing a culture of diversity and inclusiveness. So with the panel that was just introduced by Dan, uh, it, I certainly appreciate their time. Uh, I do know uh, three, two out of the three of them, Brian and I, uh, I'm sure have crossed paths in the aviation world because all three of these organizations have been around for more than 30 years. And you're gonna hear from each of them uh, as they give a presentation and then we'll do a nice round table to wrap things up. So we know everyone's still struggling with the pandemic out there and we appreciate the efforts of our industry to, to make the best of this situation. Uh, last week, Boeing did update their projections for the shortage of pilots. What that equates to for the helicopter and the vertical lift community is we're still estimate, you know, a requirement for over 50,000 helicopter uh, pilots and also mechanics, you know, over the next 20 years. So still a lot of work to do with flight schools and training environments out there and the inclusiveness and the diversity is gonna be real important to meeting those numbers. So uh, expanding that search for the qualified employees will be, will be a great opportunity that hopefully uh, our panelists today can help with. The vertical flight is a global profession and, uh, and provides career opportunities around the world. And we look forward to, to pushing into the future and coming out of this pandemic strong and, in, uh, and getting involved with the AAM, the Urban Air Mobility and Advanced uh, air mobility of the uh, vertical lift aircraft of the future. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to our first panelist and his presentation, and that's Brian. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much, Jim, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Brian Gambino, the president of the NGPA, National Gay Pilots Association. We are the worldwide LGBT aviation community, as you see right there up on the screen right now. Um, I apologize in advance, just like the turtle behind me, my internet connection that I'm on is pretty slow today uh, on the road right now. And I'm actually in a bit of a remote place in Wisconsin. So doing the best I can with the satellite internet. I apologize if I'm a, a little choppy here and there, bear with me the best you can. But again, thank you, Jim, for the introduction. Thank you, Dan. And thank you to everyone here at HAI for um, starting to foster uh, a, a new wave of uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity type uh, um, type of programming within the HAI network. So uh, being here today with you on the HAI at Work webinar series is definitely something that uh, 
I'm proud to see happening. And all of our members here at NGPA are happy to see happening as well. So um, for my full-time job, I'm actually a pilot for JetBlue. I've been with JetBlue for about six years. I'm based out of Boston, Logan. I reside uh, with my husband in Chicago, Illinois, and our little dog, Wilson, as well. Um, but yeah, the, the NGPA is an organization which I became president of this past February. I always joke with some of the other counterparts that you're going to be hearing from shortly. What a great time to take over a nonprofit organization right before we headed into the COVID pandemic. But nonetheless, here I am, here you all are, and we're, uh, we're all doing the best we can as we uh, tackle the current world situation. Um, everyone knows that I can talk a lot. I've been given five minutes, so I'm going to give you a little bit of history about NGPA. Uh, quite honestly, I don't know a lot about the rotorcraft world. I've always been a fixed wing pilot myself, um, and my knowledge about HAI is starting to grow now, and I hope your knowledge about NGPA can grow just with a little bit of a window into our world. So to kick it off up on your screen, I believe I have to click in the center here. Bada bing, there we go, that should work. Um, it is not, Dan, if you can do next slide for me because it doesn't seem to wanna work here on my controls. Just gonna tell you a little bit about NGPA. I don't see it coming up across the screen. There it goes. It might just be going real slow on my side. So a little bit about the history of us here at the NGPA. Um, we had humble beginnings uh, as a safe haven for gay and lesbian aviators. We started 30 years ago this year. It's actually our 30th anniversary here at NGPA. And in 1990, uh, there were two aviators that got together and they said that they needed a place to feel comfortable, to feel safe. So they put out personal ads in some local newspapers throughout the country that said, hey, if you are an aviator, um, if you identify as being LGBT, uh, meet in Provincetown, Massachusetts, and wear something on your shirt uh, that has something uh, involved with aviation. And that's how they first met there for that very first event in Provincetown back in 1990. And then the organization took off and continued to grow from there. Um, as the organization did try to grow, uh, a lot of opportunities for growth were denied uh, because the LGBT community was not a community that was very much welcomed in a male-dominated uh, male dominated and very uh, strong, um, uh, I don't know, masculine type industry. Those that were part of the LGBT community um, were kind of denied access uh, or were denied uh, the, the tr truth to be themselves within aviation. Uh, and that was for fear of losing your job. Uh, that was for fear of uh, being dishonorably discharged from the military if you were a gay aviator. And I'm sure a lot of folks who are listening right now, you know that that's definitely true because don't ask, don't tell within the military, I mean, only was passed uh, less than a decade ago. Um, so it's really interesting, the amazing, the amazing ways that we've progressed just in the past 10 years alone. Um, and those denied opportunities for growth came from some different magazines, Trade a Plane, uh, we tried to put an ad in trade a plane to reach other LGBT members of the aviation community to say, hey, there's a network here for you. Um, we had a rough go with Alpha, with the pilot unions who were representing airline pilots at different carriers across the US, um, as well as many other publications, uh, as well as other union groups throughout the country. But through the hard work of our members, the dedication of them to continue to progress forward, uh, the NGPA continued to grow and continue to gain some notoriety across the aviation network. Um, in 1998, uh, we became incorporated as a fully accredited 501c3 nonprofit organization, and we were able to give away our very first scholarships to support um, aviation learning for LGBTQ youth. Um, in 1998, again, was our first scholarship that we gave out that was just uh, 22 years ago. Uh, first out uh, was given out was $4,000 worth of scholarships. And from 1998 all the way through to 2020, we are now pleased to award over $155,000 worth of scholarships yearly uh, to support the dreams and aspirations and passions for folks in aviation. And like I said before, I'm so glad I'm here with HAI because we've never had a scholarship for rotorcraft training, but maybe that's something that we can change through uh, the folks that will meet through HAI and the partnerships that will form here. Um, continuing further out into 2014, we had our very first industry-wide event called the Industry Expo. And it was giving us, uh, giving us a foot onto getting global recognition as an LGBTQ aviation organization, as it was our very first job fair type event. We started with only 163 attendees at that very first event, and we've grown that event since 2014. Uh, only five years later, in 2019, we saw over 1,500 attendees at our job fair, making us one of the top three job fairs in the country. Uh, for aviation workers. So that was definitely a pride point that definitely got the name of the NGPA out there even further. 
Uh, going on just to talk about the mission of our organization, the mission of the NGPA has and always will be to build, support, and unite the LGBTQ aviation community worldwide. And how exactly do we do that? We build, support, and unite the LGBTQ aviation community by promoting aviation safety at events just like our Industry Expo event, as well as events that we attend worldwide uh, to show that the NGPA does exist. Uh, we bring in different speakers. Uh, we have talks about aviation safety. Uh, we promote FA wing seminars at our events as well to make sure that our student members, as well as our uh, some of our non-student members who are uh, in the general aviation field, continue to build uh, their toolkits to ensure that they are very safe aviators in their profession or in their hobby, uh, flying aircraft, um, wherever they may be. Uh, we provide an affirming social and professional network for the LGBT aviation community. We do that through partnerships. Uh, we have so many corporate sponsors here at the NGPA that we're very proud to have brought on to support our mission of building, supporting, and uniting the LGBT aviation community worldwide. They support us with scholarship money. They support us with um, uh, networking throughout the aviation industry to ensure that the NGPA is not only a recognized group, but to ensure that our members are getting safer treatment um, as well as inclusive work environments in their professional spaces. Uh, also, we foster the equal treatment of the LGBT aviation community through advocacy and outreach. In the past, we've hosted now three aviation inclusion summits, uh, what first was actually known as a diversity and inclusion summit, which basically brought about stories that we had reported to the NGPA from our membership about instances of homophobia or transphobia within their workplaces in aviation. We take those stories and we translate them into training to make flight departments at airlines, at corporate aviation outfits, at universities and flight schools, safer places, making sure that they know uh, to not hold any, um, any hidden biases against some of their students, their employees, and promoting within their employee groups, inclusive workspaces on flight decks, um, as well as in classrooms at the universities. Uh, lastly, we encourage members of the LGBTQ community to begin careers in aviation. And we do that through partnerships with other nonprofit organizations, such as uh, the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals, OBAP. You're going to hear from the incredible Vanessa Blacknell Jamison very shortly, as well as with Women in Aviation. You're going to hear from Allison McKay shortly as well, including others such as the Professional Pilots of Tomorrow, Latino Pilots Association, and the uh, Professional Asian Pilots Association as well. So we encourage these uh, members of the LGBT community to begin these careers in aviation through our partnerships and learning events that we host concurrently with other groups, as well as our scholarship program, which has given out close to $1 million since its inception back in 1998. A lot of people, and some of you may even be wondering, why does the NGPA need to exist? We are progressive now. Uh, members of the LGBT community are accepted in aviation now. But it's actually quite interesting if you take a look at some of the stories that we receive and you actually attend some of the training events that we have, you'll find out that we exist because of our members and because there is a need for us to exist. Depending on what area of aviation you're in, you may have experienced in the past some biases from people. Say you step, I'll relate it to what I do since I work in an airline environment. Uh, there's many times where I've stepped onto the flight deck and there's been, uh, people will see immediately, I have a ring on my finger. And the first question that they will ask me is, what does your wife do or what is your wife's name? And my response is, of course, oh, my husband, his name is John and he works in marketing. And a lot of times I'll get an excuse me look, a confused look. And it's a, a story. Basically, um, it's, it, it's a coming out. I have to come out to the person that I'm about to work with and let them know about my life that might be different from what they either A, accept, B, think is correct, or C, are even ready to hear. So we exist for our members in these instances. And I want to tell you about two of them specifically. Um, one of our members, her name is Alyssa, and she shared her story at our Aviation Inclusion Summit in the past. This story comes from just last year in 2019. She had finished her training at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University and went to a local flight school in Atlanta and interviewed for a certified flight instructor position there. She interviewed with, uh, I guess, someone from their small HR team and then went on and talked with the chief pilot of that flight school. While that chief pilot was reviewing her resume, he got down to some of the organizations, uh, well, the hobbies and organizations and volunteership that she had. And she's been a student volunteer for the NGPA for the previous four years while she was going to school. And immediately he saw that, 
recognized it, asked what is NGPA, and she said, oh, that's the National Gay Pilots Association. He stopped the interview right there and said, unfortunately, my ideals do not go in line with anyone who's part of the LGBTQ community. You do not have a place to work here, and asked her to leave. So that's why we exist. We exist for folks like Alyssa. We also exist for one of our transgender members. Um, she was an airline pilot for many years at a carrier, and then uh, about 18 years into her career at that carrier, transitioned from male to female. Um, and her very first day presenting as a woman on the job, which was supported by her company, she was laughed out of the crew room by looks and snickers from other folks, other pilots that she was uh, that she worked with many times before. They were not willing to accept the change for her to live her true self. So there's instances like that. We exist for our members there as well. We are there to advocate for them. We are there to make sure that their workspaces are comfortable, are safe, and are supportive to their continuing dreams at those companies. And last, I'll, I'll say we exist for me. I found the NGPA back in 2007. I was a relatively new airline pilot in the regional airline world. And oftentimes, just like I said, I didn't have a wedding ring on my finger then, but I would enter flight decks and I would meet uh, the person that I would be flying with and conversations would start. That felt uncomfortable to me. Maybe jokes about a male flight attendant in the back who they assumed to be gay. Maybe jokes about women who they didn't think were pretty enough or who they think were very pretty and they'd say things that are really shouldn't be shared at all in a professional environment but could also make someone like me feel uncomfortable and it made me feel uncomfortable to be myself it made me feel like i didn't have a space there because i didn't agree with what they thought was a societal norm and i didn't live my life by that societal norm so ngpa was a safe haven for me when i was a young aviator in the airline industry i met so many other folks who were like-minded who went through the same experience as I did, and through those relationships that I built there, that organic networking, I was able to be more confident in myself, not only as a human, but as an aviator. And being confident and safe on flight decks, in your uh, general aviation aircraft, in your helicopter, being confident and being comfortable with yourself and with the people you're working with definitely um, increases the level of safety that is available right there in that portion of aviation. If there's ever a breakdown in communication, we all know well as aviators that safety comes into question. And that breakdown in communication can definitely come from something such as a sexual identity, um, your gender uh, presentation, uh, or gender identity. So NGPA exists for all of these folks, they exist for these members. Lastly, I'll end off with about NGPA. Membership is open to so many people, and I encourage everyone listening here, go check us out. Head to NGPA.org and become a member. You do not have to identify as LGBTQ, what's up on your screen. There's another portion of it. A lot of you may have heard of LGBTQAI+. Uh, that plus symbol includes allies. That includes other, uh, other forms of sexual identity or gender expression. So if you identify as an ally, you support the LGBTQ community, you also have a place here at NGPA, and we will also advocate for you in supporting us www.ngpa.org is the place to um, sign up as a member here with our organization. You can check out all the services that we're currently offering and learn more about our community. And uh, we look forward to welcoming you into our community as well. Thanks for listening to that history about NGPA. I talked all about uh, some of the other organizations that are absolutely incredible and the great work that they do. And to hear a little bit more about them, I'd like to pass it off to a colleague within the minority uh, aviation groups and also a friend of mine, Vanessa Blacknell Jameson. She's the chairwoman of OBAP, the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. Vanessa, over to you, my friend. It's your show. I was hoping the camera came up. So thank you, Brian. I appreciate it. And thank you for always uh, being who you are and um, allowing us an opportunity to learn more about NGPA. So first, I want to say thank you to Jim and to Dan for and to the um, HAI for this opportunity to speak about our organization. I've been chairwoman for OBAP the last four years, and I want to tell you a little bit of history about OBAP. OBAP was founded in 1976 by Ben Thomas, who was an Eastern Airlines pilot who um, unfortunately was not able to get hired until a, a consent decree and a discrimination suit was filed. 
because there were limited numbers in 76 of African-American pilots, they formed the group, the Organization of Black Airline Pilots. About 10 years ago, the organization itself changed the name because we wanted to be more inclusive of the aerospace profession. So hence the name, the Organization of Black Aerospace Professionals. I've been involved with OBAP since 1989. My original job uh, was recruitment of minority and female pilots. As a recruiter for minority and female pilots, I learned so much about the industry and the profession because as I was growing up, I didn't have anyone like me that could talk about the airline industry. Based on that, I made the decision to uh, really look and be involved because of the recruitment aspects, but it allowed me to learn about my history and understand what's going on. So the beautiful part about OBAP is that we have always been believers and I've always been a dreamer. So we have now crafted that term dreams to careers because we honestly believe that we affect and we ensure that our next generations are able to move into this profession. So I would like to just give you a quick overview of my board of directors. We have 11 members right now. And with that being said, I am uh, happy to announce that my term is ending in December and the new chair will be Joel Webley and the vice chair will be Pamela Williams. I know we're gonna be in good hands, but I can't, I'm can't. i never gonna be too far away from the organization. I'll be on the board of advisors. But our current board is very strong and resilient and we really, really, really have made some changes. But to talk about some of those changes, uh, let me look at, uh, move this next slide. The impact on COVID this year, I'm gonna go into our programs a little bit, but I wanna just talk about current state. And the impact on OBAP this year has been tremendous like everyone else. We didn't know how to shift, we didn't know how to move, but we didn't stop. So what we did was decide that instead of looking at this as a, an issue, we knew that this would be an opportunity. So we created the Courageous, Courageous Conversation Series and it was a five part series where we invited everyone to come to just have a discussion about the racial tension that's been around, the systemic racism, being able to talk to the affinity groups and how it's affected the aerospace industry. This was a challenge because no one has ever had this conversation before, but we stepped up and we decided, okay, we're gonna have this conversation. So I ask that you please look at that conversation on our website and it's under our Courageous Conversation series. But overall, um, the impact of the George Floyd death and the need for these changes has really created a created an opportunity for us to be agile and to move into a direction by creating virtual opportunities. We had we were going to be at Bond College for the first time with the support of the president and CEO of Bond, Sharon DeVivo and work with her to do our spring meeting, but that did not happen, of course. So we pivot and we created a spring meeting, which actually was very successful. And we were very surprised because people were really hungry for information and to find out what we were doing in this space. Then of course, our annual conference, we knew that we had to eventually cancel that contract. And we did in a very gracious way, but we pivot and we also created our annual conference, but we added something else because we knew that it was time for us to have some type of celebration. And we created that opportunity by calling it the mask off. And it really turned out to be a great fundraiser for us. And uh, actually we raised over $25,000 receiving a uh, $10,000 match. And so for a small 501c3, we're not that small. We have about 2,000 members, but we've been around 43 years. So this was a real advantage for us. So I wanna give you some uh, numbers, if you can see the slides, about our Courageous Conversation. The biggest view that we had was in the part four, which was the um, 
uh, airline industry or aerospace industry. We had some really key people there, president of United Airlines, uh, Bret Hart. We had American Airlines, their diversity and inclusion manager. We had the uh, vice president from Southwest for the diversity and inclusion, and a lot of key people that were participants of this. But as you can see, we had over 2,700 uh, really uh, 2,800 people register with the attendance of about 1,500. That in itself, we were very surprised at the um, need, I guess, that people were having to, to have this conversation. But the question was always, what are you going to do after you have this talk? Because having that talk is critical, but then what are the next steps? So I'm going to continue with some additional information. With our social media and marketing, we have now um, our, we've grown tremendously as far as people looking and, and interested in what we're doing. So uh, with the website, again, it just shows that we have about 17,000 hits and we have people on Facebook looking at us. And because of this series and all the things that we're trying to do currently, we, it has been a real challenge, but we're there and we're making it work. So one of our pillars um, that I didn't get a chance to talk about, we have four main pillars of programs that we do. One is our aerospace professionals in schools. This is one of our biggest programs. And actually, we're going to do a virtual APIS starting next week, with the last day being our first ever girls launch. When you look at two, 2019 and prior going into uh, before COVID, we had actually seen close to 55,000 students. And that was just in the month of October and some part the beginning of February. Our goal is always and has been to reach over 100,000 students and visit their schools. So as you can see by these numbers in October alone, we saw 19,000, almost 20,000. And then we saw over 20,000 in the month of February. And these were actual visits. So that's volunteers and you can't do it without your membership and volunteers to make these things successful. Next. Um, I want to talk about the same thing when we look at the schools. We looked at the number of students and number of schools that would previous size with students, excuse me. But this one I just wanted to show, you know, total teacher participation and how they're becoming more engaged and more involved with what we're doing. And it has really benefited where we want to go in this virtual environment because they know that we've had the capability to make these changes. And so as you can see, the visits have been extremely strong and the teachers in schools involvement. But this is just, if you look at the numbers, it, they're small numbers, but they're tremendous in the fact that we are still reaching students and will continue to reach students, which is the first pillar for us in our dreams to careers. Our next uh, dream to careers and another pillar is our Aerospace uh, Career Education Academy, which we call ACE. Our ACE are a week-long opportunity for students ranging from the age of uh, 13, I think, believe, I was going to say 12, but I have to check that. I know it's 12 to 16 and you know, through high school. And these students have an opportunity to spend a week learning about the aerospace industry. And these academies are located throughout the country. We had scheduled 33 for this year, but as you can see, each year they've, they've been growing. Um, we've had some success in, in many cities and we've had duplicates and actually we've had sponsorship for some of these academies. The reality of these academies, excuse me, is the opportunity for these students at the end of the uh, week, they get to solo and so, or get the discovery flight. And that's all we want to do. It's touch that imagination and ensure that if we could just create that dream, that possibility for them, then we've done our job. But as, as you can see here, we created a virtual academy in February, excuse me, it was in April, we partnered with JetBlue and we had over 104 applicants and we chose 70 students to participate. And that, it was three days, they wanted it to be longer, but we couldn't do it, but we provided virtual tours of the Miami Tower. We've 
provided tours of uh, JetBlue's training facility. So you can do a lot of creative things virtually, and that's what we provided to the students. So we were really excited to continue our tradition, even though it's in a different way. But we will be back in schools and on the ground soon. So one, another pillar is our collegiate chapters. What our collegiate chapters provide is the opportunity for us taking it from that one week of, of the solo academy or and moving into now your, your basic career or going into school. We are here, OBAP has been here for a, a long period of time to support our collegiate students and our collegiate chapters continue to grow. We're at 15. We just added a new one, which is the University of North Dakota. And I remember somebody, they're looking for a dean of their school. So if anybody needs a job, please go out to University of North Dakota. And uh, But the kids are involved in there. We ensure that the chapters are doing stuff to reach out to the community by food pantry shelters doing some things. So I'd like to share some photos with you of uh, them doing the work that they love to do and to keep them active. But here's a taste of the collegiate uh, chapters that we have, ranges from ASU to Hampton University, all the way to Middle, Middle Tennessee State and uh, Middle Georgia State. And these schools are just phenomenal and the students are so engaged and involved in wanting to learn more and do more in the field of aerospace. So it's not just being a, a pilot, being a, a helicopter pilot, maybe it's management, whatever it is, it's important that these students have an opportunity to grow and to learn. So this is Western Michigan and some of the students and they're out there reaching out to the kids, going giving back, volunteering for the Martin Luther King Day event, as well as um, Emory Riddle. And you have to know that's Daytona with the palm trees in the back but they're hanging out doing great things and getting to know each other, as well as our Middle Tennessee State doing the food pantry and continuing to give back as we encourage them to do. And here's Auburn University providing their leadership and doing some different things, as well as um, the, the importance of them finishing off what they're doing. And our collegiate students, again, are the best. So a last pillar that we have is our Luke Weathers Flight Academy. OBAP started this uh, June 15th, excuse me, June 21st, 2018, and we actually celebrated our second year. Well, I'm so excited to tell you about our academy. And the intent and reason behind our academy was just to have an opportunity for our students to be able to go to a place where we know that they can get the best training the best qualifications, the best abilities of instructors, and to continue that path in helping them to pursue their dreams. We are now starting with the pilot, but our goal is to go into maintenance. As um, Dan mentioned those numbers earlier and Brian mentioned uh, with the Boeing numbers, excuse me, Jim, and, and the numbers clearly state that these opportunities are going to be there. So we plan on definitely capitalizing and helping those students grow and develop in these areas. But as you can see, the available training for Luke Weathers is um, private pilots, instrument, commercial, jet transition, all the things that are necessary. But here's some current numbers for you. In the two years, we've offered 200 discovery flights, three instrument ratings, 11 female solos. And I want you to know that those are 11 African-American females that have soloed. And that's really uh, uh, beneficial when you know that the African-American pilot population today is less than 0.2%. Uh, uh, and uh, that is what you call uh, significantly insignificant statistically. Try to get those S's out, guys, on a long day. I apologize. Anyway, 36 students um, have soloed. We have five commercial pilot certificates. 27 males have graduated um, or soloed. We have eight private pilots, six certified flight instructors, two multi-engine ratings, and five CFI ratings in the last two years. I want to talk about a couple that uh, Brian knows extremely well, but Stephanie Gotts and her husband, Andre. They just came out to Luke Weathers and spent an entire week 
offering multi-engine ratings to our students. They were able to provide them the uh, scholarships as well as brought their own planes. So that shows me that it doesn't have to be a big effort in order to give back and to help students because they use their money where their mouth is and that's what's important. So the last pillar is our Aerospace Professionals Development Program. This is an opportunity that we offer to anyone that is seeking a career and their this, this, this opportunity is really special because we know we've had impacted many individuals and they've gotten their jobs in the airline industry. We're partnered with many of the airlines to talk about what are the best candidates, what can we do to help groom them, and that's exactly what we do. But we provide mentoring, and right now we are in the crisis as usual, but uh, I say as usual, forgive me for that, but we are in the middle of a crisis. And we know that some pilots and, and others will be furloughed. So we've created our furlough research uh, resource guide to ensure that we're offering and encourage the, everyone to stay positive during this time because this too shall pass. But that's part of our APD program and very excited about that. So I know I've taken a little bit of time. Thank you so much. And it is my honor to introduce the CEO and president. I got to meet her right before she started or when she started and COVID hit, but Allison McKay and all of you at HAI would know her. Allison? Thank you, Vanessa. Yes, uh, as Vanessa said, I, um, I had the benefit of uh, starting at Women in Aviation right before our conference and then right, went right back into um, a shutdown. So um, I uh, was fortunate to get to meet Vanessa um, right away. Women in Aviation International was created in 1994 um, as a mechanism to um, not only encourage women to enter the industry, um, but also provide them with the support as, um, as they grow in their careers. Um, we also uh, really um, are look, looking at the, the benefits of the women that have kind of blazed the trail. Um, and we wanted to highlight the, uh, the stories, the accomplishments, um, and the contributions of those pioneers um, that came before us. And, um, and so Women in Aviation was, um, really at the forefront of uh, highlighting those stories and, um, and creating a sense of community. So where are we today? Um, we are a very strong, active organization. We have over 15,000 members, uh, both individual and on the corporate side. Um, we have members that um, are from 89 different countries. Um, these, uh, these members are, um, are very, very active. Um, they, they support each other. They created a network, um, especially during this pandemic, um, to support each other through what is probably the most difficult time our industry has ever faced. In addition to um, individual memberships, um, we also have a robust chapter network. Our chapters are um, in 20 different countries um, and um, they create a sense of community um, on a more local level. Um, and I, I think that um, they, they really support their local communities with um, events and networking opportunities, um, even, even during this pandemic when we have uh, really been isolated in our home environments. Um, they, have, uh, they have scheduled Zoom happy hours and um, and different types of networking events and support groups to help their members get through this challenging time. Um, I think that they are probably more active um, and, and are hosting more events now than they would when we, um, when we were able to get back together um, prior to the pandemic. Um, the support that these chapters provide um, on a local level is really invaluable to um, our organization as a whole. So when we get into the programs and what, um, what I think is really the linchpin of, of who we are and, and what we do, um, it, it has to start with our scholarship program. Um, the scholarships were created right as we started the organization um, and have continued to grow um, a, as we have as an organization. The support that we have from our community, from individuals and from companies 
um, that want to give back and want to help women as they go through all the stages of their careers um, is, is really, really overwhelming. Uh, to date, we've given over $13 million away in scholarship. Um, and in, uh, in 2020 alone, it was over $800,000. These scholarships are not just for those entering the industry, but for additional career development. Um, and, and aren't just for pilots and maintenance technicians. They are the full gamut of, of what our industry has to offer in terms of professions. 2021, um, our applications are open right now for scholarships. Um, and you can go to our uh, website, wai.org, to see all of the opportunities that exist uh, this year. We have um, to date 82 scholarships available. Um, which is a little over uh, $600,000 in value. You, are, um, you do need to be a member to apply, but all of the applications are on our websites with the how-tos of, uh, of, of getting through the, the application process. <clears throat> um, one of the other programs that is um, incredibly critical, especially now, is our mentorship program. On our website, um, you can um, look for um, a, a mentor that is just tailored for you, whether it be um, in, a, in your local community, whether it be a particular uh, industry, whether it be a particular profession. Um, you can find the mentor that is best suited for you um, and, um, and engage on a, a very personal level. Um, and, uh, and you can see, see more about that program again on our website. Uh, but I, I think it's invaluable, especially right now as we are navigating um, one of the most difficult times in our industry to find somebody that has either gone through something similar before or is going through an experience um, that is the same as you uh, currently. Um, that, that relationship is really critical to getting through especially difficult times. As we look at organizations that are interested in creating a more diverse workforce, uh, uh, finding organizations um, that you can um, look to, to, to post your jobs, to find that, um, that workforce, that talent that you are looking for. Um, our organization is, uh, is a prime example um, of, of the way that corporations and companies can look to diversify their workforce. We have a program called uh, Jobs Connect, where our members can post their jobs on our website and have it seen by our 15,000 plus members. Um, it's a great way to, to isolate a, uh, a diverse group of uh, employees that you are looking to target. The next generation, um, if, we, if we do take into account those Boeing numbers, we need a, a huge influx of interest in our industry and talent to come into our industry. And so we have to look at, at our youth. Um, and uh, we created Girls in Aviation Day for that purpose. Um, it is, um, we are in our sixth year. Um, it is a, a, an event that is, um, is typically hosted um, throughout the world um, at in-person events um, and, uh, and really um, introduces young women to all the industry has to offer. As you can see from these stats, um, we continue to grow um, our in-person events. Um, and in 2019, we hit over 20,000 children. Of course, this year, the pandemic shifted our plans to, to host in-person events. And so we had to pivot and we decided to, um, to create some virtual content. Um, we didn't want to, to lose the day just because um, we weren't able to get out into our communities. Um, and so we created a, an app. Um, if you visit the App Store or Google Play and you search for women in WIAI events, you will find the Aviation for Girls app. Um, it is created with, um, with mentor um, interviews, with tours, um, and activities targeted um, to, to young women and boys who are interested in um, all our industry has to offer. When kids sign up, um, they also were, um, were able to um, have a merchandise kit sent to them. Um, this kit um, not only uh, includes some fun, fun, fun items for, um, for kids to have, but also augments some of the activities that are on the app with hands-on um, learning tools. 
Um, and uh, and we, um, we were really excited with this year's event um, that we hosted September 26th. Uh, we, um, we had this app downloaded um, in 55 countries. Um, with our in-person events um, the year prior, we only hosted 18 uh, country events. So um, the growth internationally by giving kids the access to an app like this uh, was really exciting. Um, and it is something that we are looking to build on um, as we uh, continue into 2021. Um, hopefully, we will be able to get back and, and host in-person events, but this app is going to live um, and, and just keep growing, and we are just going to add content um, as the year progresses. So I invite you to, um, to keep, keep uh, in touch with us as we start planning um, the next event, which is uh, September 25th, 2021. Um, if you would like to host an event um, at your company um, in your community, please just reach out to us. We are always looking for uh, new ways to engage local communities. And finally, um, networking and in-person events um, are uh, really vital. Um, I think that um, especially now when we haven't had access to them for so long, uh, we are all looking at for ways to get back together. Our next annual event is our, uh, our conference. Um, it is just a, a week and a half, I think, prior to um, HAI Heli Expo. It is gonna be in Reno, and we are really looking forward to um, bringing our community back together. Uh, we host um, a lot of different networking um, events, um, great speakers um, to inspire you, um, as well as educational opportunities and professional development. Um, so please um, look at our website um, for more information about our conference. And I uh, look forward to seeing you in March when we can all get back together. Um, I don't wanna take up any more of our time. I know we wanna get to the round table discussion. So I wanna invite uh, Vanessa and Brian um, back uh, onto the screen so we can start our discussion. And Jim, of course. Well, great. Uh, thanks, Allison. While everybody's coming back on, I want to thank you for the great presentations. The amount of information that uh, that you guys put out here in the last uh, 30 to 40 minutes has been amazing. I think the uh, the girls in aviation certainly has a particular spot in my heart. You know, I had three sisters. I was the only son. And then I had two daughters, and now I have uh, three granddaughters and uh, one grandson. So uh, some of the products that uh, you put out, Allison, I certainly have passed on to, to my children and grandchildren. And then hearing from you, Vanessa, with uh, you, your message to me was be who you are. And it certainly resonates back to what Brian was talking about, the same deal of, you know, be who you are in this world and, and uh, you know, what you can contribute to, particularly here, the vertical flight and uh, aviation industry. So thank all four of you. Uh, I think everybody, you know, we all talk, we're all new except for Vanessa. I also, you know, started in January right before COVID. So Brian, myself, and Allison are all in the tough year. And Vanessa's just kind of laying back as the pro, just saying, <laughs> wow, what a way to finish up as we head on to the challenges. So with that, you know, I'd like to start off with that challenge because it is the challenge of the industry, you know, with the uh, the shortages we saw about through the industry. Do you think that this year, and, you know, we're in October now, but you know, the recovery on the aviation side, depending on what the mission is that the vertical aircraft is being used for, do you think it's going to lead to more diversity or is it going to hurt diversity, the COVID factor here? No, we're sitting here. I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, I, you know, that, I'm sorry. Yeah, I could raise my hand first because I know you need lead time, Brian. So please go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> first Vanessa I would never step in front of you ever okay so yes um, I think it is going to lead to a real <laughs> challenge we still have to have the opportunities to be presented in front of us but right now um, Jim when you look at the numbers alone there still is um, they're very small and so we need to find the way to continue to educate and create those opportunities and so um, knowing where we are today, it, it won't be right away, it will be in the future, but while we have this time, we can create and begin to create more opportunities. Over. All right, 
Brian. I would say, yeah, I, I think for adding to the diversity within aviation is definitely going to be affected by COVID. And for a couple of reasons, uh, within the LGBTQ community, um, getting into aviation is already a, a space which might seem too far off, not, not, might not be a space for me to get into. And now with decreased opportunities in aviation due to COVID, due to the downturn, due to the kind of pause on hiring and whatnot, that's going to really uh, stave off some job opportunities, which will further um, have a uh, de-inclination for people in the LGBTQ community to get into aviation, um, as well as the, the financial issues, which are going to affect uh, a lot of our a lot of the other minority communities, people of color, uh, LGBTQ youth are already at a financial disadvantage. Um, girls, young young women, girls in aviation who already feel that they too have a barrier towards aviation, it's going to further push off the work that our organizations have been doing so well um, in encouraging uh, minority groups to get involved in aviation and also the downturn in support for our organizations. We are nonprofits and a lot of the funding that goes to all of our organizations to do the work we do to encourage uh, minority communities to get involved in aviation is definitely going to take a big hit over the next couple of years. So that, that'll definitely be a detriment and probably a, a bit of a, a bit of a halt, just like the uh, 65, uh, the 65 age retirement yep. was extended from 60 to uh, 60 to 65, put a stay on the industry for a bit. I think this is also going to halt things, not only for people already in the industry, but for people wanting to get into it. I'd like to take a, a, um, a, a different vantage point and say that I think that it is also um, an opportunity for us to, um, to come back from COVID stronger than we went in. We look at um, the amount of press that was around our industry prior to COVID in terms of the amount of people that we needed to enter the industry. I think there was a real awareness from our uh, aviation community on the impact that they were already feeling before the pandemic on um, how to hire talent. And they were looking at ways to, to try to, um, to create uh, more talent that was interested in this industry. Um, and, and you saw that with our Girls in Aviation Day, the amount of growth that that program alone um, has had over the years. Um, so, you know, I'm, op I'm optimistic that we can build back an industry that was stronger than we went into the pandemic and and strength comes with diversity great no those are all great great points and uh, I, I mean i'm telling you the presentations that you gave were so thorough that you know some of the questions i had in my mind were were covered in those presentations the importance of mentorship uh, being a big one um, which was you've all highlighted out so dan is there what are there any questions from uh, from our viewers uh, actually, not at the moment. Um, I uh, do encourage our viewers to use the question module on the side of the uh, control panel to submit their questions, and we will do our best to get to them. So, Brian, uh, you, you told us early on that you were a talker. What else would you like to say that you didn't cover <laughs> in the presentation? <laughs> Well, I've got to rough up Vanessa just for a second. In her presentation, she talked about during the Courageous Conversation series that OBAC ran, which, which was absolutely incredible. For those of you who haven't had the opportunity to view the Courageous Conversation series, head to their website, obac.org, and you can still view all the recordings from those. There was an incredible piece uh, that I think is really important for everyone, no, no, matter, no matter what color you are, no matter what sexual orientation you are, no matter gender preference, no matter what you fly, whether it be a rotorcraft, a fixed wing, you fly a, a, a Honda Civic, I don't care what, you, what, what you're operating, um, it's definitely good stuff to hear. But what I'm gonna rough you up on, Vanessa, is you okay. talked about all these high profile folks who talked on Courageous Conversation, you failed to mention me and you failed to mention Vanessa, <laughs> yes. very important as well. I'm just kidding. Okay. So you know what? And that was the first conversation. So we when you really think about it, it fun. was, yeah. It was all the affinity groups that we brought together first, Jim, because it was important to hear from our community and what we've been dealing with. And um, there is a point that I want to go back to the last question real quick um, that I didn't get a chance to say. Majority of the, uh, and, and Brian, you touched on it though, but majority of the minorities and females of recent hires are all the ones that are at the bottom of the seniority list who are getting furloughed. 
So when I think about them coming, the impact that it's going to have on them, it's going to take a while for them possibly to get back, but we still don't even know. There's so much uncertainty. Will, you know, will people fly again if the vaccine comes? Will people believe in it? Will they fly? Then will the jobs be saved, you know? And, and I, I commend the airlines. Are we going to get another stimulus package that's going to help the industry, you know? Um, all those things, all those variables, but it's going to take a while to really, that's why, and I agree with you, Allison, we have to look at the, the opportunity that's here and knowing that we're going to come out stronger because the interest, we are creating the awareness is what is what's needed. And uh, we have to continue to do a bigger job in that area too. But financial? Yeah. There is a lot of momentum though behind um, the 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 concept of uh, creating a diverse workforce. You know, the FAA has um, a number of different um, uh, groups that they've assembled to try to address, you know, why aren't there more women in the industry? How do you get more youth into the industry? There is there is such a groundswell right now of action um, and, and thought and groups that are being brought together to really try to identify why haven't we been more successful over the last uh, decade or more in bringing, say, women into the industry. Um, why aren't we tracking more data on how many minority groups are are flying or fixing? Um, you know, we're not even measuring some of these things that are, are so critical to see if we are actually making a difference. Yeah, uh, all great points. And it was good to see some of the uh, the grant stuff and, and what the FAA and governments are doing. Hopefully mm -hmm. set an example of uh, what other governments can do internationally. So I did get a note that uh, we do have some questions now. So over to you, Dan. Oh. Okay, um, we have a, first of all, it says, thank you for the presentations. Um, the air medical community is very homogeneous. How does an organization create a diversity program? Hmm. Well, well, yeah, I'd be happy to. I, I was just giving an opportunity. I think it's by talking, number one, and deciding what are your goals and objectives? What are you going to be intentional about? What are you trying to achieve? Are you, are you looking to diversify your office? Are you looking to create awareness within your office about diversity and inclusion? What is it that you're seeking? So whatever it is, be intentional. In, in determining what it is, have the discussion, and then reach out. Reach out to organizations like NGPA, WAI, WAI, as well as OBAP, and let us help you build in that arena, but also um, use your expertise in the medical area, and that's another area that needs a lot of help too. So, you know, let's, we can partner in how that could be structured, but having the conversation also is very important. And I always right. end with over, so that gives you my clue, yeah. over. Thank you, yeah, and go ahead, Dan, give, give us another one. Okay, uh, are your virtual initiatives going to be better to reach a wider audience? Are sponsors going to support these initiatives? Right. Want to try that one, Allison? All right. We'll go for that one. Um, we, had, um, we had overwhelming support from our partners. I, I like to call them partners and not sponsors because they really are um, hand in hand us on what our goals are. Um, our, our virtual girls in aviation day was overwhelmingly supported by our partners. And I, and I do think that it, it casts a wider net. Um, and, and we saw that with the amount of countries that we were able to hit. There were, there were countries that we don't have chapters. We didn't have members that somehow found this app and these girls downloaded it. I mean, it's, it's so exciting to see, um, across the world, this interest in aviation, um, and and I think it's just going to continue to grow. We have to stay in the virtual space even when we do get back together. Absolutely. Brian, do you have any count? There you go. <laughs> yeah, I didn't touch on the virtual events uh, in my presentation, but the, we all need to be in this world of virtuality, I call it, in order to survive in this time apart. And here at NGPA, our, our sponsors have stepped up in a big way to help us out with our virtual content. Uh, so far, we've run seven different webinar series uh, since COVID came out, uh, dealing with areas of medical guidance, financial guidance, uh, 
um, mental health guidance, overcoming a furlough or a layoff from the industry. Uh, we had uh, getting your logbook in tip top shape for those people who might be out of an aviation job and they have to dust off that logbook and get their numbers back together. Um, and we also did one with John and Martha King, some of the champions of general aviation flight training. They came on and did an informational webinar with us as well. So our sponsors have stepped up in a big way to help bring this virtual content um, to everyone, and it's not just to members, anyone who's listening right now, if you want to check out some of these things that have happened in the past, you can go to ngpa.org. On the top banner, you'll see COVID-19 member resources. All of our webinars are there for you to view. Or if you want to take it with you on the go, we've turned them all into podcasts as well. You just search NGPA podcast, um, either on Spotify, Pandora, or iHeartRadio, and you can hear some of our sponsors bringing really um, uh, time-appropriate information to the aviation community. Uh, in a time that they need it. And we hope to continue to grow, not hope to continue, we will continue to grow our virtual content um, along with the other organizations and Allison, Vanessa, and myself, along with the incoming um, chairman of OBAP, Joel, we're talking about ways that we can all work together going forward to bring um, new content and new ideas to uh, continue to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion across the aviation industry and partner up with all of our organizations. No, and, that's, cast that, and cast that net. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. The uh, the content creation uh, certainly something that I've learned here in the last six months of you know the importance of as you created you know it's stuff that becomes uh, you know permanently uh, resources for your membership. So I think it's great. And all uh, I think Allison said it. You know all the stuff we've learned as we went into virtual. We're going to uh, expand beyond that when we get back to the in persons meeting, and it will just add to the ability to to get those stragglers that couldn't show up, but yet you know make sure they didn't miss anything. So good deal. I think Dan will probably take one more and then uh, we'll let you wrap it up. Okay, well, let's uh, finish it with our regular routine final question. What is the single most important message that you would like our viewers to take away from this webinar today? All right, well, we'll go around uh, in my order. I got Allison up top, so we'll let her go first. Uh, I think um, the, the main the main takeaway is organizations are stronger with a diverse workforce. Um, with a diverse um, um, thought um, and, and and taking whatever their past experiences was and bringing it to the table, um, there is there is nothing to be lost by um, really looking outside um, your own your own comfort zone and uh, and and really kind of taking on new ideas and and that comes with with a diverse workforce. Great. Uh, over you, Brian. The biggest thing I'd love for viewers to take away is to be true to yourself, be exactly who you are to those around you, but also be kind. You can't always just come out swinging if someone doesn't agree with you. Be kind, always be ready to listen, be ready to learn, and be ready to make positive change in your life. And sometimes the best thing to do if you can't meet on an equal playing field is close your mouth sometimes and, uh, and move on and hopefully do it in the safest way possible. So that's what I've got to say. Over. All right, Brian, and then Vanessa. Yes, for me, uh, it's my standard line. You have to be inclusive in order to have diversity. So we need a seat at the table. We need to have the discussion, and we need to be able to talk and be open freely to have that conversation and not make it personal. It's about where we are and where we're going today and how we make this a better world for all of us. Over. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's been a, a wonderful, a uh, little bit more than an hour here, but I, I appreciate the people that have signed up and have come to, to gain this. And as well, I think, uh, Dan, I'll let you do the, the closeout of, you know, this will be posted online. So you, your members that uh, that didn't get to hear you live will can also see this later. Over to you, Dan. Thank you very much for everybody. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I, I concur with Jim. Uh, we had some incredible information. The presentations were fantastic. Uh, we did have a handful of questions we were not able to get to, but uh, I'd like to express my appreciation to Brian, to Allison, and to Vanessa. Uh, thank you for working to make our, our industry better. Um, that's uh, That was the goal. Uh, not only does diversity and inclusivity uh, make us a better industry, but there's so much potential right now to expand our industry. So I think that uh, this is a really great time to try to expand these programs. Thank you so much. Uh, appreciate your time and uh, your support. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye everybody.
Uh, coming up next, uh, please uh, save the date for HAI at work. We have uh, more webinars coming up. Uh, next week, we have representatives as yet unidentified from the California Army National Guard firefighters. These are the uh, teams from uh, both Chinook and Blackhawks who uh, saved over 400 community uh, members from the Creek Fire there in Central California. Uh, they just did an outstanding job. And we get to hear from them not only about the rescue operations, but also about the other firefighting activity that they've been doing uh, this summer. Uh, California seems to be in a never ending fire cycle. So it'll be interesting to hear about how they are being utilized in that aspect. Uh, also for a big reminder, December 10th, we wanna make sure everybody is aware of this. The FAA Administrator, Steve Dixon, will be joining us for a Q&A uh, with Jim Viola. Uh, we expect that that will be a very worthwhile event as well. All of our events are at uh, 4 p.m. Eastern time uh, each week, each Thursday. Watch for the link in your email, through your social media, and in Rotor Daily. There is a follow-up questionnaire that will be coming to you shortly. We do ask that you spend just a few minutes uh, on uh, responding. One of the great things about it is it allows you to tell us what uh, we're doing right and wrong and suggest uh, future webinars. What would you like to see us address in a future webinar? And as always, we finish up, let us know what HAI can do for you. Let us know what we're doing right. Let us know what we're doing wrong. Let us know if there's something we can do more of. Uh, the easiest way to do this is to contact us through president at rotor.org uh, as an email address. Send us your challenges. Let us know how we can help. Jim sees every single one of these uh, emails that come in, and then he tasks the uh, staff with uh, responding for them. We do appreciate your time. Uh, until next week, we ask that you fly safe, that you be safe, and we'll see you then.